So this session is all about um, some food enterprises stories around crowdfunding. It's a follow-up session from a session that Louise hosted last week, um, which was um, what is crowdfunding and how could it benefit your food enterprise? And so today as a follow-up to that, we've got three food enterprises with us who've agreed to tell us their story um, and chat to us about what their experience was and any learnings that they had. Um, so we've got Dory from Local Glasgow, we've got Kathy from Your Pantry Glass, and we've got Iona from the Sidwell Street Bakehouse. So thank you all so much for coming. Um, really appreciate you, you being here and sharing your experience. I'm sure it's going to be useful to, um, to any other hubs now or in the future who are thinking about doing a crowdfunder for their enterprise. So, so thanks for this. Um, so um, who would like to start? Is that, would anyone like to volunteer to be the first to chat? I'm happy to. Awesome. Okay, thanks, Yona. So, yeah, if we could start with you, yeah, just tell it. I don't know how my internet's working, so, yeah. Um, hi, so I'm, I'm my owner. I'm part of the Sidwell Street Bakehouse, which is part of St Sidwell's Community Centre in Exeter. Um, so St Sidwell's Community Centre is it's a registered charity. Um, we have been in existence for about four so. Um, and we started a bakery as part of the community centre a couple of years ago, mainly using funding from Power to Change. Um, but in the last year and a bit, we realised we didn't really have enough space where we were. Um, so we started a crowdfunder. We, 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 we secured a space via the city council and Princess Hay, who are um, managed manage some spaces. Um, for free kind of on a charity basis um, and we started a crowdfunder to convert that space um, and so we had to mainly kind of to install three-phase electrics for our ovens um, put in plumbing like there was no, there was nothing here at all and and make it into a food safe space um, so we so yeah the, the, the main thing was kind of practical costs of moving um, and we everything we do is with volunteers so um, we, our aim is kind of to make like real, like good local organic uh, bread accessible, as accessible as possible in Exeter. Um, partly through people learning how to make it themselves and partly um, through selling at a more affordable price than, than some other bakeries might. Um, so yeah, that, that was kind of what we're crowdfunding for. So we had, we had a mixed model of funding. So. Um, we secured some from um, the Crown Estate, who also are part owners of our um, of the building that we're using. Um, everyone's frozen. I don't know if anyone can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. I think it's um, maybe that like your um, because your your bandwidth is small, it might just look like we're frozen. Cool. We're all, we're all, yeah. <laughs> I just like happens. everyone is frozen on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. I'll, I'll just carry on. on. No. <laughs> Thank you. Hopefully, I'll be all right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we, we had a mixed a mixed model of funding, and I think that was that was quite a good thing for the crowdfunder, so that we could say we've already raised um, it was around between five, well, about eight thousand pounds that we'd raised already, and then we wanted to get another three to five from crowdfunding. Um, so we actually, I think, I think one thing that, um, well, it sort of went well and badly at the same time. And it, in a way, it was that we, we did massively overachieve on our target, which, which was amazing, but also meant maybe we should have thought, <laughs> thought better about how to set that target and, and potentially have been a bit more ambitious in, in what we wanted. Um, so we did, we did an all or nothing crowdfunder, which I think is why we set quite a, uh, a, lower, a lower end target because we were worried, particularly at the moment, like we just didn't know how much, how much money people were gonna have, how, how engaged people were. But I think in, in reality, this, it was quite a quite a good time to be doing a crowdfunder because people just really wanted something positive to look at and um, like so where we are in Exeter I don't, I don't know if anyone knows Exeter but it's kind of quite a um, uh, like a relatively run down street and there's a lot of empty shops so just kind of we we had a our kind of messaging I mean it's, it's still up online so anyone can can have a look at it but it was around like partly volunteers who are uh, coming to learn new skills here, partly around kind of revitalizing the street itself a bit and bringing more people into the street and 
um like hopefully that has a knock-on impact for other businesses and stuff as well and then partly around in the long term kind of providing a sustainable income stream for the charity as well so those are our, our main our main mess there um so so yeah but i think i think it was kind of really positive in that people just had it was something to look forward to really um and then i think the other the other thing that i'd say was quite good for us was that obviously we're, we're an existing enterprise so we have quite a lot of customers and i think um particularly using the open food network platform over the last oh well, since since the pandemic um we started the home delivery model and i think a lot of people were like oh you helped us out in this time and so I think quite a lot of people were kind of quite keen to give something back to us because we did lots of yeah delivered bread by bike around Exeter for the well we still are doing it but a couple of times a week over that time and um and I think it was quite so we we built a lot of those relationships already and I think that made a really big difference to how successful the crowdfunder was um so we uh just, I'm just looking through my notes sorry um <laughs> So we, we used, um, we, we had rewards as part of the crowdfunder, um, but I'd say about, uh, I, think, I think it was probably around 50-50 of people saying they did or didn't want, didn't want rewards. And in the end, quite a lot of people didn't take up their rewards, even though they had chosen them. So um, I think a lot of people, it was kind of more about giving something than necessarily getting back. Um, uh, I think the, the main, yeah, I'd say a couple of other things that we really thought about was we used the, the physical space that we had. So we had already secured, I'm going to turn this around and you see this is our shop window. Um, so we've got really loads of space there. Um, so we got someone to kind of write lots of, in, in very nice writing, all about the crowdfunder and also other ways to get involved. So we wanted to make sure that people could could come and get involved regardless of whether they had money to donate or not. So loads of people got involved with like painting the space. So you can see, I mean, this I think you, there's some photos on the original crowdfunder of what the what the space looked like before, and it's it's very much transformed. So I think um, people being able to get involved in that way, it's been really good. It's also like got the hype up for when for when the bakery actually opened just before Christmas, people actually, they knew it was coming. We had all of that as part of it. Um, and then also just having conversations with a lot of our regular customers and kind of friends of the bakery about the fact that we were gonna be launching it in advance. Um, did quite a lot on social media and also like regular newspapers and stuff, put some press releases out in advance and just, um, tried to get the message out in as many channels as, as possible, um, which was really good. Um, dee, 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 dee. I just see there's a few questions. <laughs> awesome. so. There's a couple of questions in the chat. I don't know how everyone yeah. would like to do today. Um, we could leave the questions to the end maybe and then just have them all, all at once or does, is everyone okay with doing that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah um, is that okay? Or we could we could ask them now actually we could do it one episode because we've, we're, we're five for time um so um yeah I'm, I'm I think I think the first one was um yeah I, I don't know if Louise you fancy reading out the questions from the, from the um, chat yeah Rachel asked um do you think your crowdfunding campaign went well because you could already say you had uh, money behind you do you think that was one of the key things about I think it definitely makes a difference and particularly because our target you know we I think we wanted it was kind of 13 to 15,000 that we really needed and actually the reality of doing up a building is that you always need a little bit more than you think you do even when you, you know, even when you budget for a little bit more um so uh I think I think having that all as a crowdfunder target would have been too much had it been a smaller amount that, that we needed if we'd only needed 3000 in total I think we probably would have been okay with just the crowdfunder but with that bigger total I think it was um, really useful to to have some other stuff there and also to kind of know that other people were backing it already does does make a difference it's also then kind of works the other way around as well for for very, like funders in terms of non individual funders but grants and trusts and stuff um they're happier if there's crowdfunding input rachel did you want to add any more sorry i don't know why i read out your question you can read it out yourself <laughs> do you want to add anything I'll, no, I'll no, ask actually, any more. 
I was imagining that that was probably the answer, but uh, it's good to hear it from from you that I would, yeah, I'd have thought that if you already had money there, then people have trust in you. So mm. yeah. There Do was you a, want uh, uh, Rachel? The other one. Yeah, you read out your other question. <laughs> okay, so uh, I mean. Um, I didn't quite understand how long have you been operating and at what point did you do the crowdfunding? Mm. So, so we, um, as a as a community centre, we've been running for about 13 years um, as, a, as a registered charity. Before that, we we're actually a healthy living centre, which uh, so I, and I've been involved for the last um, three and a half years or so, at which point I started to bake some bread at the community centre and run some bread classes just on a kind of you know, like slightly voluntary bits and pieces of funding here and there. Um, then we put together a uh, application to Power to Change Community Business Fund, um, who gave us a significant grant to set up the bakery in the first place. So that was for our oven mixer, um, converting what was a tiny office at the community centre. Um, but we really didn't have enough space there to make it into a viable business um, with all the other things that happen at the community centre as well. Um, so we secured other premises and then we launched the crowdfunder to move over to the new premises. So we already had quite a, you know, a, an existing customer base and, and History. friends, <laughs> friends yeah. of the centre, yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Jonathan, you had a few questions. Would you like to ask um, Iona? Uh, yes. So uh, the first one was, um, were the funders that... Uh, came on board were they all local people were they people who knew you um primarily yes um so there were definitely like i say like quite probably a majority of people were customers then kind of friends and family of of staff and and volunteers um and then i think in terms of other people um who gave there were there were other local people from exeter but who we didn't know before who'd kind of heard about it through through social media or or other other organizations had shared it and how, how many how many people were involved in in the, who, who how many people gave money in fact oh i gotta check that i can't remember um 154 okay online and then we had a few offline donations as well actually but um yeah i, I had another yeah, so it was quite uh, a big thing do you want to ask your other questions Jonathan? oh sorry can you hear me? Can yeah, you hear me? Oh, can now. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I just had another quick query. Um, how, how long did the whole process take the crowdfunding process? What, um, you know, from beginning to end sort of thing? Um, so the, the crowdfunder itself, once we launched it, it ran for four weeks. Um, but we, um, we were probably planning it for a good few months before that. And I think that made all the difference. Um, we, at, at St. Sid was at the community center, we have run a crowdfunder in the past, which I wasn't that involved with. And we really didn't do that prep and it, it really wasn't that successful. Um, it was also a bit more of a, it wasn't such a tangible project, the last one as well. So that, that wasn't particularly helpful either. I think this was good because it was very, very tangible. People knew exactly what, um, but I think like the prep time definitely made a big difference. Like really kind of, working out what your message was and making sure that that people you know know about it in advance particularly for those like first few days it makes a really big difference if you get a few decent donations in at that time because it gives people confidence um in the process did did that crowdfunding site um did that do all the did they do all the um uh, sort of marketing for it or or, or did, is that something that you did or how, how did that all work? Um, yeah, you have to do all the marketing for it really. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure they might, they might do the odd bit of sharing, but as far as I'm aware, I think sometimes they feature stuff on their, on their homepage and stuff, but I think most people will come to it because you point them. them about it in one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I just yeah. had a very, secondary question about the bicycle yeah which is cool it's but is it human powered or is it electric or it looks huge it's electric <laughs> it is okay yeah. <laughs> i was imagining these vast people trying to cycle that thing but anyway no although I, to be honest it's, it's still going to work fairly hard because it's quite a heavy bike but right. yeah, it is electric <laughs> yeah okay thanks very much
Awesome. Thank you so much. You know, that was really fascinating and like so many useful things packed into, into your story and, and also massive congratulations for hitting your target. So yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, oh, there's one other. So I just say the, the um, we got funding from from one of the other, like there's other funding, fund, uh, funding you can apply to through Crowdfunder and that's quite useful as well depending on what you're doing so we got some from sovereign housing who actually uh use the upstairs of the community center they've they've got a um they've got housing there um so they gave us some money towards it so that was that was helpful awesome that's really useful to know so thanks for that great awesome thank you um so who would like to go next well, i can go next cool thanks Doro. Hi, so I'm Doro from Lookmore, and um, we're a community interest company in Scotland, and we do lots of different things. We have, we now have two shops, and we have a farm, and we have a veg box scheme that we use in conjunction with the Open Food Network, um, and we do other stuff as well. But anyway, let's talk about crowdfunding. <laughs> so we've done a bunch of crowdfunders in the past. Um, We've been going since uh, Lugabra started in um, late 2012, I think, and uh, we did, and we didn't start through crowdfunding. So that's something we've never done, this kind of standing start. But like by the time we started crowdfunding, we already had um, a shop and uh, and a farm and a bit of an audience. So I think that was, and that was really helpful. And I'm not like, <clears throat> so I don't have experience with like spreading the word before you're actually there in the community. Um, our original crowdfunders, so we did a bunch of different ones and I thought I could say a bit about all of them. Well, original, our first crowdfunder was in early 2015 and it was basically to, it was called raise the roof and hatch our plans. And it was basically fixing all the problems that we had at our market garden and didn't have some money to fix ourselves. So we had a really bad winter storm and the polytunnel roof flew away and um, and just none of it went very well and we needed to make some money so we decided to get chickens to sell the eggs because um, that seemed a bit more profitable than um, all the veg we'd grown so far. <laughs> it was kind of the early days and we hadn't figured it out properly yet. And so the good thing about that was it was like the story, you know, our polyton was broken and it's fixed, it cost this much to fix it. And we wanted, you know, a chicken, like a house for all the chickens. And it's kind of, that's, I think that's really helpful. I think that's the main um, the main thing we've learned with crowdfunding is like you want to have a really nice story to tell and like a kind of project that's easy to understand so you know we buy the thing or we, or we do that and um, and I think that was really good for that um, you know like and, and I think there was this reward like you get your name inscribed on the chicken shed but I'm not convinced that ever actually happened but <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, um, and that was, and I remember that one being a lot of hard work. So I think we were aiming to ra raise six and a half grand. And um, and I just remember us doing endless social media posts about it. Um, we did get there in the end, but I just remember us never shutting up about it ever. And I started to feel quite embarrassed. Um, and towards the end, um, when it was getting close to the finish date and we still hadn't raised all the money, we just ended up doing a post whenever someone donated or like um, put money into the crowdfunder. So, and, and that actually helped. And I think that so that was an important lesson, just keep going on about it. It's fine. Like if you don't do that all the time, people will not stop following you because you're annoying. Um, just really, <laughs> really go for it the social media. Keep talking about it. Um, and I think then there's also the rewards and all of our, like our rewards tend to be geared towards getting people to come into the shop and spend more money. So we have a lot of rewards. So with the chicken shed, we had this reward where you, where you put in, uh, I'm just looking at it right now. So there was a 24 quid one where you would put in um, 24 quid and you get an, an egg box a month for a year. And that would bring, you know, and that would mean they would get something, but also they come into our shop on a regular basis and hopefully buy more. Um, and we always did a lot of that. And I remember, and I remember that really being a thing of like having lots of people come in to collect eggs every week for a year. And you know, you can, we had a more expensive one where you got one every week and we had a veg box thing. So I think with the, with the rewards, we always try to offer a really broad spectrum. So you have something for someone who's skinned and just wants to show support. Um, 
so we had a our cheapest reward was a tenor and then we also have like something for people that have a bit more money and really want to support us um we had i'm going to look for the most expensive one that people actually went for um oh it doesn't actually say anymore never mind um but we had like one way we'd get a veg box every week and uh and an egg box and that was 614 i think someone did that um so and so that was if, if you had a bit more money you could invest into local war and he would come into the shop to collect your vegetables and all that um so that that went really well I, but i remember that being hard work and then we did another one then we did a lot of crowd then we did a lot of fundraising um it wasn't just the crowdfunder it was a look of a big plan and that was basically to open our shop in Govan Hill that we now have, and it was quite a big site and a lot of work done to it, and we needed to raise, I can't remember how much we, we went for in the end, I think like 150,000. And um, and so the crowd tender was only a small part of that, so I think we were aiming to uh, raise uh, 15 grand and we ended up with a bit over 17. Um, and I think the, like, the, I think the, that crowd tender was just really like, kind of a, uh, like an easy thing where anyone with a bit of money could um, pitch in, um, you know, you could get a reward for a tenor. And, uh, you know, and you, I think we had one, like you got a, for 20 quid, you got a look for a shopping bag and a bit off with your next shop, that kind of thing. Um, so there was kind of cheaper stuff there. And then we really actually tried to um, raise the kind of the bigger amounts through other avenues rather than crowdfunding because I think the crowdfunding is amazing for because I think it does the buzz really well. You have that little meter that tells you how close you are, and you've got the and you've got the counter on, and you have a pretty website and the pictures, and people are used to that format, and you've got the rewards. It's kind of a, a fun thing for people, but actually, uh, you spend a lot of money on fees, and you have to give people stuff at the end. So um, you know, you have the credit card fees, you have the crowdfunding fees, um, which is fine. I understand why they have to charge that, but obviously. If you want to raise like that much money, you'd rather get something where you, where you don't have to pay all these fees. So we had, um, we did a loan stock as well, which is basically um, private people would just lend us money and they do a bank transfer. And then we'd give them a certificate saying that we've received it and we would pay them back. And then we'd pay that back over like five years or something like that. And they'd get a bit of interest. Um, and that's a bit more like paperwork to manage that, but it does mean that you're like, it, it's, a, it's a lot more useful, I'd say, for having money to work with. Um, so, uh, so that's how we kind of raised the larger amounts of money. Um, and then we had, like, I think, one or two big investors that invested quite a lot, and that was a separate thing again. Um, so it was so we used it kind of for smaller amounts. Um, and uh, but yeah, that went well as well, and we opened that shop. Um, so that was a two big crowdfunding, and we didn't do any for a really long time. And then we needed some money in 2019 to buy a new electric van and just do some other stuff. And so we had to look at what was electric crowdfunder, which I don't know, I feel like it didn't really inspire me. Like it wasn't that great a story. It was like, okay, we'll like pay the deposit for an electric van. But um, it actually did really well. I was surprised to see that it actually is by far the most successful crowdfunder we did because we went, I think we raised 140% of the of what we were aiming to to raise so it went well um and um but i think we were really helped i think that was at a point where we had a really big reach in the community so we were you know we were aiming for like let me look at it again um so i think we were going for ten thousand, um which was less than the previous crowdfunding when we only had a tiny shop and much less vegetables customers and we were just much less known in the community and um, and I think that one we were you know a much bigger deal like in in the south side of Glasgow so to speak, and had a lot more social media following. So I think it was just a lot easier, and there was just a lot much larger pool of people that wanted to help us out. Um, so it, it's it's been getting a lot easier to do those crowdfunders. And then the latest one was just a couple of weeks back, and that was the look for a to the crowdfunder, and uh, basically that was to see whether we should open um a cafe that we took over just before the pandemic in the city center and then shot like 10 days later whether we should reopen that as a shop and so it wasn't really about raising like it's helpful to have some money to do the fit out but it wasn't really about that it was mainly to see whether you'd have people going for it and wanting that so it was more of a feeler for like 
how do people feel about it? Do people put their money behind it? Is there a bunch of people that would probably end up becoming regular customers because they buy like, a, you know, 10 coffees or whatever to have uh, when they're in the shop um, through the crowdfunder. So it was, uh, so that was, that was a much smaller one. That was just, I think we were aiming for three grand. And, um, and, uh, and so that, and that went pretty well. We didn't do too much social media on it. I think we did one, one post every day um, across Facebook and Instagram and all that. And, um, and it kind of, and it got funded like a couple of days in and, um, and then we kind of stopped talking about it because it was a bit like, okay, we, we have to support it and fast. That's all we need. We don't like need to raise tons more. It's fine. We'll just go ahead and do that then. Um, so that was, that was a really nice one. And that felt pretty straightforward, but, but I think that again, that's been really helped by us having a much more of a presence in, in Glasgow now. Um, so that's, that's all the stuff we've done. Um, so, so yeah, I think overall it's been, it's been really helpful for us, but I think at some point, if you, if you want to raise large amounts of money, it's useful thinking about other, other ways to do it, where you don't have to like give like, a, like several percent to a crowdfunding platform. Um, yeah, um, I think, yeah, I think that's kind of all I have, but if you have questions, uh, go ahead. That's quite a few questions. I just want to say first of all, like that um thanks for, for sharing your perspective. It was really fascinating. Also really interesting to see that you've used crowdfunding almost to kind of like as a way of like like sussing out your customers and whether they want, you know, like almost like as a kind of customer research thing. So that's a really interesting angle to, to speak about it from. So thanks for that. Um and Louise, are there um so there quite a few questions in the chat? Cool. Yeah, Rachel, you go ahead. You've got a couple. <laughs> I was just writing one down. With four campaigns, um, would, would you say that you found it to be the same funders throughout? Are you finding a pattern there? Um, it's, it's been kind of a while since a couple, so I haven't looked at the names. But I know like we always have a core of really committed customers that are always wanting to help us. Um, and so there's there are some names that have been getting that I know from like running the Vegbook scheme from back in the day and that put money into every crowdfunder. And I see them come into the shop every week. And you know, and like there's definitely those. Um, but I think there's also I think there's there's also always a bit of kind of um more opportunistic people that just hear about that one and kind of you know, put in some money, but maybe then don't end up being super engaged with all things local at all times. But I think, like, I think probably a lot of it actually is from kind of the more committed regular customers. Yeah. yeah. Um, looking back on your really intense social media campaign that you were talking about, that yeah. it was it was really time consuming. Um, can you see an easier way of of raising the profile of of your crowdfunding? I mean, surely that that is the way to do it. Yeah, I mean, okay, it's... you're benefiting by having a good following in the shop now, but yeah. the early days. I mean, I think now, we're, like now, we just wouldn't have to bother to do that unless we were going for a lot larger quantities of money. So we've just released an, a new business plan, and I think for that we will have to do a lot of shouting again. Um, but but yeah, I mean, at that stage, that was just what we had to do to to get the attention, and so that was what we did. And it's you know, and it's like two weeks of being. Um, are really full on <laughs> and kind of wondering whether you're really boring people by talking about the same thing like several times a day but um but yeah I think that that's that's the one way we had of doing it that time and it worked so I think yeah so would you say that social media is the most consuming out of the whole process or or is it to actually create the right pitch in the first place I think I think probably like I think the social media is obviously a really important part or like more generally advertising it like it doesn't have to be social media if you've got other avenues of doing that advertising then you said as well I think we had a big sign up in our shop and all that um, and hassled people with leaflets about it. Um, but I think it doesn't really like I think you always have to have that promotion because it's, it doesn't really matter if you've got the greatest. Um, pitch and you know and it's all wonderful, but as, if people if not enough people know about it, then you're not going to reach that target. Um, so I think there's always going to be a bit of that. Yeah. Thank you. Jonathan, you had a question. 
Yes, uh, just a, about, uh, j you said the fees ended up adding up to quite a lot. I suppose yeah. it's um, uh, crowdfunder fees and, and uh, card fees and pay, you know, other stuff. What, how, what sort of proportion did that end up absorbing in the end? Um, don't know it off the top of my head. So I'm just having a look here. So, um, so I know the like, so with the last one, we made a bit over three grand and then we had a um, hundred pounds crowdfunding fees and then just under a hundred pounds transaction fees and then a VAT. So it's like just under 250, um, which is like, so 250 off a bit over 3,000. I, I don't know, someone can do the math. I don't have it in my head right now. Um, like it's not, it's not terrible, it's fine. Um, but if you, but you know, if you're raising like 50,000, um, it can be like, the, the, you know, it, it kind of adds up. And then also I suppose, um, it's not just that you have the fees, which are kind of, you know, which you can kind of just factor in, but um, but also there's this thing where um, I suppose it's kind of like if you give people like un unless you have this kind of thing, oh, just give us money and you're not getting anything for it, you have you, you then have this big job of like fulfilling everyone's kind of rewards, which ends up which can eat up eat up kind of oh, everyone's going sorry, um, we're just gonna have to ignore that. Um, um, but it's kind of you, you end up having a lot of money that you then immediately need to do something for like having having something like the X subscription over a year helps to spread it out a bit um, but I think generally it's it's like if it's big amounts it's kind of I don't know it feels a bit more manageable if it's actually a loan and you know and you pay it back over like five years and you have a bit of time to actually grow your income with that money that you've raised before you have to give it back. Um, I think it's, it's maybe more accurate than just complaining about the fees, which are fair enough. <laughs> I, I quite like the idea of using it as a kind of marketing budget and saying, well, you know, that's the cost of marketing, essentially. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah, you can look at it like that. That's yeah. a way of doing it. Yeah, thank you. Awesome, thank you, Doro, and thanks for the great questions. Um, so uh, yeah, really, really awesome to, to hear the stories. And yeah, so um, Kathy, um, it's your turn if you'd like to share share your experience. Um, I'm sorry, I've just got, I just have to say bye. <laughs> I've got to go to a parents <laughs> meeting, so. <laughs> really nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Like, and uh, crowdfunding if you, if you decide to go that way. <laughs> thank you, bye. Bye, thanks. Okay, um, yes, we a pantry glass, we're a zero waste shop in Llandilo in Carmarthenshire, Wales. Um, we started off with just a, sh a shop and then during the uh, COVID sort of a year ago, we decided to go online and because we'd used OFN before, that's why we're uh, an OFN user. Um, we have uh, quite a lot of organic stuff we have fresh fruit and veg, and we're, we're sort of now referring to it as natural foods. We started with the idea in March 2019, and we actually managed to open in mid-June. That was a bit mad. And I think the crowdfunding we did during May. Um, we'd already applied for a local council business startup help for a lot of the, the infrastructure, because obviously as a zero waste shop, we have um, bins, containers, tills and, and things like that and scales that we needed to fund. Um, but we, there was obviously also still a big gap um, in, in finding all that money, looked at options like loans, and but I don't like paying interest, I can help it. Um, so picked up on the idea of crowdfunding, so decided to give that a go. Um, and our aim was to spend the money on infrastructure stuff. So, you know, people could actually walk in and know that it had funded bins and things rather than had helped fund the initial stock and that sort of thing. Uh, we went for an all or nothing and it was a fairly modest, um, it was fairly modest 5,000. 
within that, we, uh, we hit it just at the time that NatWest was started up a thing called Back Her Business. And because we were three, three mums that were setting the thing up, we were eligible for that. So if we hit 50% of our target from a certain number of uh, donors, NatWest then topped it up for us. So that was one of our reasons that we actually went with Crowdfunder as well. Um, as well as the fact that I sat down and worked out how much the fees would be. And I, I think the fees work out at about the 3% mark sort of thing. By the time it's the fees and the transaction stripe stuff and things like that. Um, all or nothing means that if you don't hit your target, you don't get any money. Um, whereas if you go for um, the, the other one was that you, you just got whatever you you got. So you might have a target of 3000, but if you only had a few hundred pounds donated, you would still get that money. All or nothing means you've got to hit that target of 3000 or whatever you set it as. So it was gets quite nerve wracking as to whether or not you're going to hit it. We did rewards. And again, I'm, I'm slightly spreadsheety, geeky, IT. I sat down and worked out what the cost of each of the rewards were going to be, as well as the cost of the crowdfunding, so that hopefully, you know, we weren't going to make a loss on it. Um, some of the rewards were vouchers for the shop, where obviously you're going to be selling the goods at some point later on. So that almost works out like a loan, in as much that sort of people perhaps you know, in, invest ten pounds. They get a five pound voucher you've got to give them those five pounds worth of goods later on but um they've in essence loaned you that money in, into the future and, and they might never spend it as well so um that was always a good um a good option um we were from a bit of a, a standing start i we did a google survey uh, which we advertised through Facebook, which got a fair number of people engaged. But um, you do need to be prepared to chase, nag, cajole people to um, contribute and that sort of thing. Uh, far better to get 10 people to donate £10 than one person £100, which you might never get. Crowdfunders funding, they do recommend you go for direct mail, phone, talking to people because that personal contact works a lot better than um, necessarily just um, social media. But on the social media side, again, I did some preparation work. So whilst we were doing the four week campaign, I had stuff ready to throw onto social media without me having to think and write stuff too much because those four weeks are very intense. It, it is literally a, almost a full-time job of just doing the fundraising. Um, one of the things we did at, at the end is we got a chalkboard in the shop with the names of the people who um, funded us through Crowdfunder. And it's still occasionally a talking point. People come in and, and go, well, what are all those names up there? Because we haven't taken them down yet. Um, one of the things I did pick up on partway through our campaign was I had some one on one coaching with Crowdfunder. They've got lots of videos on there which talk you through what you should do. But I think if there is one on one coaching available at the beginning, the game is worthwhile doing. It helps give you some moral support if you've never done anything like this before um, to, to know what you're doing and that you're heading in the right direction because you need to make that campaign effective when you're doing it in, in that those I think they recommend three four weeks is, is the best length for a campaign. Any questions? I think a lot of them have been asked beforehand with uh, Iona and Dora. Thanks so much sharing. I, I, um, I mean just just I've got a quick thing that I just want to say and I think that the chalkboard idea like is such a nice idea because then it's something that you can kind of have in the shop like long after the the campaign that people it's like that seems to kind of generate that really nice sense of like belonging like people will see their names there and feel like they've contributed yes. so that's a really awesome idea yeah. 
we we actually you we actually painted the board. We got chalk ball paint and, and painted it on the wall, and then did chalk. They made stencils, and then uh, um, used that to uh, to write because none of us are particularly good at, at writing like that otherwise. Nice, I love it. Great idea. Um, Kathy, do you there. think it's it's Why something? Kathy, do you think it's something you'd go back to in the future if you needed more money or? Uh, as like um, to test out new products or a new idea or something or or is it do you not think you'd try it again I for me I think I'd always wanting it to be something tangible like an electric bike or van or something like that for going out and doing deliveries or something like that I think it's um, nice to have something definite that you're asking people to contribute to um, rather than um one of the things is if, if you get a good story going there are people within the sort of crowdfunding thingy that will just go oh that looks interesting and and will sort of perhaps donate and that sort of thing you'll get donations from people that you you know you don't know who why or anything like that or within social media again if you know anybody with a big following if you can get them to do a promotion because uh, I've picked up on on a few since then that have popped up on my Twitter timeline or on Facebook and that sort of thing. And you go, oh, that looks interesting. And, and then you have a look and uh, think about investing yourself where you've got no connection. So it's, it's finding those links to go out um, and create a network. I have a question sort of for all three of you, really. And I know that... Um crowdfunder and everything you read online says that you need to create video but I also know that creating videos can be quite challenging I mean what did you do it what was your experience do you think it was crucial to the campaign or anyone I'm thinking I, think I remember creating a video okay. <laughs> I, think I can remember doing videos of the shop to show what the progress was and, and that sort of thing and there were never people in it because none of us wanted to be in it in front of the camera. Doro? Yeah, I think we had a video for the big plan because uh, that was uh, our first bigger crowdfunder. Um, and basically because uh, I think uh, because the crowdfunding people told us that videos are really important. Um, I don't know if that if you like, I, I don't I don't think the success of the crowdfunder hinged on that video. Um, it probably did help had help having a it was kind of um, I think it was, I think it was mainly Ruben, um, it's kind of cute, um, but, um, but, but yeah, I don't know if you, like, I think, like, don't, like, don't, like, I think it's not essential, and if you don't think you'd be able to make a good video, then, like, do something that you're actually good at doing and have good rewards, I think really that's the main thing. Yeah, I, th I think that reminds me, I think what we did was we had stills of people measuring things into containers and weighing it. I think somebody's child actually sort of did the hands and, and, and that sort of thing. And then we just zoomed in and out and put text around it. But I think it's having a picture because some people react to pictures better than words. Yeah, I, I think that's really important because, yeah, some people just particularly, I think for the people who are coming to you to donate because they already know you it doesn't really matter like they're coming because they want to support you already but for all the people who just some you know they see it on social media having something that can communicate in a minute or two minutes and just give you a few key points even if I think you know they just say just do it on a phone like ours actually I think you know I was, I was quite pleased with it apart from the fact that I hate watching myself in videos but um we had a volunteer who was really keen to do a video so sometimes there'll be someone who wants to help in that way and lots of people have those sorts of skills and, and he really loved putting it together so it was kind of rewarding for him as well. Rachel had a question so do you want to ask anyone or who? Um, yeah anyone really but how how do you go about setting your reward values or your donation values presumably you need to have well, no, you don't necessarily need to link your don your donation value to reward value, do you? Talk to me about rewards and, and donations. <laughs> I, I sat down and worked out different rewards at different price points, giving different things, and then worked out, you know, if it was going to be a £20 
donation for that particular award to make certain that you know if you're going to lose three percent or to, to the fees and then the cost of the items and that sort of thing you take that in, into account um and and then came up with some fun names for them and that sort of thing i think our rewards were always pretty close to the value of what it was so it was, for us it was more about getting people through the door with the eggs or whatever and i think also I, I think I just always feel like it needs to be something good. Like if you're asking for 40 quid and then you just give them like a bag or something, it just feels a bit underwhelming, you know, it's like in me as a person who sometimes puts money into crowdfunders, I always feel like it, it feels more like a thing where I want to get something back. Like, yeah, I want to support, but, um, but also it's really nice to actually get something for your money. Um, so I always have that in my head. Uh, I think, I just remembered, I hadn't talked about that before, but with a big plan crowdfunding we did, we offered some workshops and we totally could have taken more money for them um, because mm -hmm. they were wildly popular. Um, we kind of, we did, I did a baking, like a sourdough baking workshop, which was really ahead of the curve, wasn't it? Um, and I offered, and it was, it was great. I, I, I think it was like, you, you, it was like four hours on a Saturday or a Sunday and you'd come to my kitchen and we'd bake bread together. Um, and that, that sold out several times and it probably would have sold out more times if I had offered it more times and people probably would have paid more money for it as well. Um, so that was a really good one. And I think we were quite cheap compared to like other workshops you can buy. So I, I guess the secret is to find something that doesn't cost too much yourself, but has an impact, a big yeah. impact on the recipient. Yeah. A workshop would be great for yeah, that. Yeah, that was really good. Yeah. I think I've seen um, somebody else, uh, one of the shops in Cardiff, when they did it, I think she had lots of links with other businesses around. So she got some of the businesses to donate things that they could put online. So again, there was sort of uh, workshops or yoga sessions and things like that. Um, so it's, it's another way that you might have that someone can give you their time that you can then convert into multiple rewards that you then put online and, and that sort of thing. Iona, what was your experience? Um, so we had, yeah, rewards kind of ranging from five to five hundred pounds um, and we got uptake across the whole range. Um, we had a, actually a few five hundred pound donations offline who didn't ask for rewards at all. Um, I think quite a lot of the time when people do want to give a big amount, they just they just want to give it to you. <laughs> and actually they don't like they want to help you. So they don't necessarily want you to be spending it on on their reward. Um, obviously, that depends on the person. So kind of having having the range is, is quite nice. So we would sort of like we've got some little badges that um, we've had a community center of uh, Sid Weller, who is the patron saint of Exeter. Not that we're a religious organization, but we are linked to it. Um, uh, so they, they were like the, our kind of cheapest reward um, and then the 500 pound one was um, bread and a sweet treat for a year so it's kind of it was paying slightly more than than you would pay if you came in and bought it but only very very marginally but then kind of on the same basis that a lot of people then won't necessarily take that up every single week um, so you and then obviously your cost of production is lower than your cost of sales so again you're not you're not losing money there. Um, and then in between we had, you know, things as well, you probably just see in the corner there, there's a, a, a tote bag. So things that advertise for you, things that fit, bring people in. So we had, so we're doing loaves of bread, but like scored with people's initials so that it was something a little bit personalized, but didn't cost us anymore. Um, and then we did things like, um, like, uh, bread for other people. So like, I think it was our 40 pound reward would be that, um, like we give out X number of loaves for on, on behalf of that person to other people who might need them. Um, so I think like that's yeah for quite a lot of people that that, that was quite a popular one actually because um, again people kind of wanting to give and then wanting to give they, then they feel like they're giving twice or well, they are giving twice in fact but um, yeah so quite a range. Nice ways. idea yeah super thank you. <laughs> I got time for one question more or two um i don't know kate did you have anything and you wanted to say today or are you quite happy i know that um i've 
just written them um, five pages of notes. Sorry. <laughs> I think everybody's asked everything. I was going to just ask about like forward donations and I'm just writing some notes about it because I love that. That would tie in a lot of what we're doing here. Um, I'm struggling a bit with the rewards as well, thinking what we would do because obviously we've got loads of traders. So getting them, the money will be going to the hub, not to the traders, and then but it would be the traders that we would need to ask. But I'm thinking about things like free delivery and things like that, um, kind of tying in with what you said, Doro. So it it means that they would they would get the benefit of it if they do order with us. So it would keep them tied into spending with us, so that we don't. Um, yeah, so I'm kind of trying to think along along those lines. But it's been really really interesting. I've got loads and loads of food for thought here. I've just written pages of of stuff. <laughs> Thank you all so much. But yeah, I'm just trying to think of other things because at the moment we're not running a market um, and we're, we're almost completely online at the moment. And, and the point of us raising money is to kind of get us back into a situation where we can have a market and have those things. Um, so it's a bit tricky to be promising things on the back of what we might raise. It's a bit of a scary situation to be in just in case we don't raise it and we can't deliver it. <laughs> that makes sense. So any, any advice on that front, welcome. Maybe the all or nothing would work then because if you don't raise it all, you don't have to deliver. But then that doesn't that doesn't rely on COVID behaving itself. So, yeah, I don't think anyone can predict on that one. <laughs> no, it's so hard, isn't it, at the moment? But um, but yeah, but then having said that, you know, one thing that I've got from all of you is just prepare, prepare, prepare. So, you know, by the time we're sort of like planned and maybe ready to go, hopefully a lot of the restrictions will be lifted and, and things may have work some of themselves out anyway um, which would be amazing thank you that's really uh, really interesting i'll hand back to kate <laughs> uh, to kate awesome thank you thank you and thanks everyone